Hey everyone, this is part four of our series. If you haven't watched the other parts of this series yet, please watch those videos first, as these videos are all built upon each other and they need to be watched in order for proper context. If you already have watched the other videos, then let's get started with part four of the New Testament Unveiled. Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Beit Tefillah. The New Testament. There are just so many problems, so many issues with the New Testament, it would take dozens of these videos that I'm doing to cover all the problems. This series is primarily about the invented Messiah, so I really don't want to cover too much of what Paul wrote, but I'm going to throw in a couple examples to show just how far off base and plain wrong that he is. Let's start off from the book of Galatians. Galatians 3.11, and that no one is declared right by Torah before Elohim is clear, for the righteous shall live by belief. What? Deuteronomy 6.25, which is our definition for righteousness, states, It is righteousness for us when we guard to do all of this command before you who are Elohim, as he has commanded us. So did that read guard to believe, or was it guard to do? Deuteronomy is guard to do, right? The Greek mindset is thought, and the Hebrew mindset is action. Philosophy, from the Greek philosophia, literally means love of wisdom and the study of knowledge. Since a Greek mindset is based on belief, this is why we have all this just believe stuff and no action required throughout the entire New Testament, which was written in Greek. That's why the New Testament is so dangerous for all the Christians and people who are thinking that they can get into some kind of heaven merely by believing on this fictitious Messiah. Let's hear the verse again, keeping in mind that it is the action of obeying the Torah that makes one righteous, not merely some belief in it. Notice the direct contradiction to Torah. Galatians 3.11, And that no one is declared right by Torah before Elohim is clear, for the righteous shall live by belief. That, my friends, is a lie of the highest caliber, and like Hasatan himself was writing the silly chapter of Galatians. Once you know the truth, it is actually painful to read this book of fiction. Let's cover another couple of verses from Paul that are just plain wrong. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4 For I delivered to you at the first that which I also received, that Messiah died for our sin according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures, exactly where is that information in the Scriptures, Paul? It's not in there anywhere. There is something that sounds sort of like in the book Hosea, but it's talking about the tribe of Ephraim, and that's real easy to see in the text. So that's not it. But people won't check. They're going to take Paul's word for it. After all, that's how the whole religion of churchianity, Christianity got started, is people taking Paul's word over Elohim. We've already covered in a prior video that these things were not prophesied in the Tanakh, but those in churchianity and the messianics are going to believe it anyway because they don't study the Tanakh very well. They don't prove these things out. This Paul guy, or the creative writing group that wrote under the name Paul, caused more arguing and confusion than anything. And his letters, or epistles, which is just the Greek word for letter, are absolutely pointless because we have the Torah to follow, especially because quite a bit of what is attributed to him is against the Torah and mostly commentary on this fictitious Messiah. And that's as far as I'm going to go with this fake apostle Paul, who was absolutely no kind of scholar when it came to the Tanakh, although that's who he was reputed to be. There's no way. Now we're going to cover some of the absurdity, error, and plain old blasphemy about this Messiah, or things this fictitious Messiah supposedly spoke, that is written in the New Testament. Now I want to stop here and say, maybe this Yahushua Yeshua guy really did live, and maybe he was a prophet, and maybe there were some things recorded about him, but the New Testament, or what we have of it, was altered to the point of it being absurd. Because a lot of it that we're going to read that was supposedly spoken, or that's attributed to this Messiah, is just so against the word. So let me preface what I'm going to say with that. We don't know what is real, and we don't know what isn't real. But what we have in the New Testament, we can't hold up as truth. And that's what we're going for today. Okay? We're going to prove that out. First we have Matthew one twenty one. And she shall give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Yahushua, for he shall save his people from their sins. Well, there's a lie. We've already covered this. 
that a man cannot die for another man's sin. Also, Elohim says, I am your Savior, there is none but me. Next verse, Matthew 9, 28-30. And when he came into the house, the blind men came to him. And Yahushua said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Master. He then touched their eyes, saying, According to your belief, let it be to you. And their eyes were open. And Yahushua strictly ordered them, seeing, Say, let no one know. So all they had to do was believe. Where is that kind of thing in Torah? See, here we go with this just believe nonsense that's littered all throughout the New Testament. Next verse, Matthew 10. 7 to 8. And as you go, proclaim, saying, The reign of the heavens has drawn near. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Where in the Torah is that? Raise the dead, even? Wow, where did Elohim ever say that that kind of power would be given to men? Let's hear what Elohim said in Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, I am he, and there is no Elohim besides me. I put to death, and I make alive, I have wounded, and I heal, and from my hand no one delivers. But this Christian Messiah supposedly bestows his power upon mortal man? I don't think so. The power of these things belongs to Yahuwah, not man. Here's another good point. Name one single verse in the Tanakh where it instructs anyone to cast out a demon. Is there an instruction manual for that? In Judges 9.23, in two verses in 1 Samuel 16.14 and 23, it talks about an evil spirit from Elohim, which is not the same as a demon. Come to think of it, try to find a verse anywhere in the Tanakh where anyone was possessed by a demon. It's not in there. Yet in the New Testament, well, by golly, it seems like everybody and his brother is possessed by a demon. Okay, next up is Matthew 10.32-33. Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, him I also confess before my Father, who is in the heavens. But whoever shall deny me before men, him I also shall deny before my Father, who is in the heavens. Now, if this was truly necessary for salvation, that would be huge, and it would be spelled out very clearly, not to mention repeatedly in the Tanakh. But it's nowhere in Torah or the prophets. Just not in there. Let's look at the next one. Matthew 10, 37 to 40. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his stake and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life shall lose it, and he that has lost his life for my sake shall find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Seriously? So in order to get to the one who sent him, you have to receive him first? Again, this is just so huge that Elohim would have most certainly told us, but there's not even a single mention. No, Elohim does nothing without first revealing it to his prophets, as we're told in Amos 3.7. For the Master Yahuwah does no matter unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. And is silent on all of this. And this would be such a huge deal. Okay, up next is Matthew 10.42. And I'm sure all these are very familiar to most people. Okay, this one is, uh, is a doozy. And whoever gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a taunt one, truly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Excuse me? So Torah tells us this, right? We are told in Torah that if we merely give a cup of cold water in a disciple's name to someone, that we're not going to lose our reward. Isn't Messiah just pulling stuff out of the air with some of this? Because this... This is not speaking according to the word. Okay, here's another biggie. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. All have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and he to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. All have been handed over to him, huh? Okay, and where did Yahuwah tell us this was going to happen? And the only way to know the Father is to have the Messiah reveal him to you? Again, these are such huge events that would change so much of what Elohim told us. And despite all of this grandeur and all this just big talk from the Messiah, nothing that we have heard from him so far was foretold by Elohim through his prophets. Never. And by the way, Malachi 3.6, For I am Yahuwah, I shall not change. So either you believe Elohim or you don't. Next verse. 
Matthew 12, 37. This is similar to what Paul wrote. For by your words you shall be declared righteous, and by your words you shall be declared unrighteous. By your words, huh? That's a far cry from the righteousness verse again, Deuteronomy 6.25. And it is righteousness for us when we guard to do all this command before Yahuwah our Elohim as he has commanded us. Guard to do the commands, not just speak them, not just by your words. If your house is on fire and you're sitting in your house, do you actually have to get up and do something or do your words count? Do you say, well, I suppose I should get up and leave. No, you better get up and leave or you're going to burn. So it's more than your words, it's action. Consider the following, that the Tanakh actually speaks against paying lip service or words without the action of obedience. Isaiah 29, 13, and Yahuwah says, Because this people has drawn near with its mouth, and with its lips they have esteemed me, and it's kept its heart far from me, and their fear of me has become a command of men that is taught. So are we seeing how Christians are going to fall for this New Testament stuff, even when this Messiah takes the action out of obedience? All you have to do is merely believe it and speak it. Sure. Okay, on to the next problem. Matthew 12, 38 to 39. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answering said to them, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. He said this right after he was doing miracle after miracle after miracles. As a matter of fact, when he said this, it was right after he got done doing the first miracle with all the loaves and fishes that fed a multitude. Okay, Yet there's going to be no sign. Yet he's running around healing everybody, raising the dead, walking on water, making the blind, seeing the deaf hear, but no sign for you. On to the next one. I'm getting kind of animated with this because it makes me pretty frustrated that people sometimes have a really hard time seeing that this does not match Torah at all. Matthew 16, 18 to 19. And I also say to you that you are Kepha, and on this rock I shall build my assembly, and the gates of the grave shall not overcome it. And I shall give you the keys of the reign of the heavens. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in the heavens, and whatever you loosen on earth shall be loosened in the heavens. The footnote to this verse states that binding and loosening is a Hebrew idiom for exercising authority, like to prohibit or permit. So this Messiah is saying that mankind has the power to do this? That man has the authority and the power to bind and loosen things on earth and up in heaven? <laughs> Consider this from Job. Job 38, 31. Can you bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loosen the bands of Orion? These are constellations up in the heavens and we are being told by Elohim that man has no control over them. So let's pause and consider this claim that the Messiah, believed to be the Word made flesh, is apparently and obviously contradicting the Word itself. This should be extremely obvious by now to anyone who is paying attention. Next. Matthew 18, 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depths of the sea. Wow, once again the writers in the New Testament make this Messiah out to be that important, and yet nothing is found in the Torah about him that says this. Give me one single solitary verse where Elohim said something to the effect of, If anyone causes someone not to believe in this Messiah that I will send you, then it's better for them if they were drowned in the sea. If this Messiah was that important, then Elohim would have told us somewhere. Just one verse, but nothing. Do you see a pattern developing with this? Next, Matthew 18, 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning any matter that they ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in the heavens. Where did Elohim ever tell us that he will give us whatever we ask for? We have a verse in Torah to back that up. Do some people think that the Creator is like a genie in a bottle and that He's going to grant their wishes as long as two people pair up and wish for the same thing? Next, Matthew 19, 16 and 19. And see, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Elohim. But if you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. And he said to him, Which? And Yahushua said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, respect your father and your mother. So why didn't the Messiah say the commands in the Torah? 
he gives this guy just five commands from the Torah and sends him on his merry way. And those five right there will give that guy eternal life. Also, this is taken away from the Torah, which we are forbidden to do. Deuteronomy 4.2, do not add to the word which I command you and do not take away from it so as to guard the commands of Yahuwah your Elohim, which I am commanding you. Once again, the word made flesh contradicting the word. Okay, next is Matthew 19.21. Yahushua said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Seriously? When Elohim said, be perfect, even as I am perfect, I don't think to be perfect, was him saying, get rid of all your stuff. Look at Abraham and how he walked with Elohim and how he was richly blessed. He had many animals and possessions. So did Jacob. He had two wives, 12 sons, and Elohim was with him wherever he went and blessed him greatly. Nowhere are we told that they just gave away all their stuff, that that was a requirement by Elohim. Why are they going to give away everything that Elohim blessed them with? The next little gem we have is from Matthew 21, 20 to 22. And the taught one seeing it marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither so soon? And Yahushua answering said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have belief and do not doubt, you shall not only do what was done in the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be removed and be thrown into the sea, it shall be done. And whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. So besides just giving them another sign, which he said he wasn't going to do, once again we are hearing more of this just believe doctrine. I hope this is getting very easy for people to see. The outright fabrication of this Messiah is just off the charts. You know, there's just a ton of discrepancies in the New Testament that revolve around the Messiah or what he said. I don't think the writers could keep their story straight. Let's hear a couple examples and some brief summaries. And uh, these are from the four gospel accounts. Okay, John 16, 33, Messiah says, These words I have spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. But in Luke 12, 51, he says, Do you think that I came to give you peace on earth? I say to you, no, but rather division. In Matthew 10, 34, he says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Okay, uh, here's a weird one. Matthew 17, 12 through 13. But I say to you that Eliyahu has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. In this way, the son of Adam is about to suffer by them. Then the taught ones understood that he had spoken to them about Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist. Something different from John. When they asked John the Baptist in John 1.21, they asked him, What then, are you Eliyahu? So he said, I am not. They said, Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So apparently Yahushua and John the Baptist disagree on who he is or what he represents. Now, as I said in an earlier part of this series, people are afraid to lose this Messiah as they think they will lose eternal life. Well, the writers of this New Testament wrote it that way to give you this feeling of being caught. And let me explain. People are kept stuck in the Messiah rut because we're told in the New Testament that if we deny him, he'll deny us to the Father. That he is the way and the truth and the life, and that nobody gets to the Father except through him. Or something like in John 10.10, 10, where he says, I am the door, whoever enters through me, he shall be saved. So I guess, if he was the door, and if you don't believe in him, then you're not getting through the door. But we have to remember that the Torah is the way. Not some Messiah. No place in the Tanakh did it ever state by Elohim or any prophet, that one day you would need to go through a man or a messiah to get to Elohim. Nowhere. And then all of Christendom's favorite verse, and everybody knows this well, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that everyone who believes in him should not perish but possess everlasting life. So what's the flip side to that last part in John 3.16? That people who don't believe in him will perish and not possess everlasting life. See how they catch you with that? You feel that if you lose this Messiah, that you're going to lose eternal life. Once again, with this very well-known verse, the all you have to do believe thing is mentioned, and that all of humanity's salvation depends on your belief in this Messiah. But this information is strangely absent in the Tanakh, where Yahuwah tells us that He is our only Savior and there is none else. By the way, as we covered in the previous part of this series, Nowhere in the Tanakh is any Messiah said to be Elohim's only begotten son. 
The title of Elohim's son, or his firstborn, was given to the descendants of Jacob, the people of Israel, not just to one man. Another verse is John 14, 21. He who possesses my commands and guards them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I shall love him and manifest myself to him. So, the catch is that you need to love him to be loved by the Father? Hmm. See what I mean? This is why so many people have such a hard time with this series, as they are caught in this messianic web of lies that makes them fear for their eternal life. People, we need to get rid of this messianic idolatry, because being idolatry really is going to mess with our eternal life. Okay? Elohim tells us that. Our eternal life is not dependent upon any Messiah. It is dependent upon coming into covenant with our Elohim, who is the only one who can deliver us and who is our only Savior. Well, that's all I have for part four. Join us for part five of our series, Messiah Misunderstandings, coming up next. Thanks for watching, and shalom.